Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shabak Festival, one of the world's largest festivals of contemporary Arab culture. My name is Arman Nouri. I'm speaking to you today from North London, and I'm really, really, really excited to be your host today for this beautiful event. Since the 20th of June, Shabak Festival has been the home for an amazing range of art and culture online, as well as in many places across London. There are still another two weeks of amazing events left, which you can find out all about and book on the Shabak Festival website, shabak.co.uk. But today we're here for Unearthing Heritage, the first of three special webinars for children and young people produced with the support of Qatar Foundation International. Over the next half an hour, we are going to be traveling over 4,000 miles to hear from two brilliant artists who are going to talk to us about their heritage and their identity and how they use art to explore and understand both of those really important things. First, we will spend some time in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, speaking with Farah Fayad, a graphic designer. Then we will cruise over to Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates to hear from Rand Abdul Jabbar, an Iraqi artist and architect. Both Farah and Rand have created amazing artworks for Shabak Festival this year, and I know they're really looking forward to telling you all about it. After Rand, there'll be some time for questions and answers, and we would love to hear from you. You will notice a button at the bottom of your screen that says Q and A, questions and answers. If you have any questions you want to ask, please, please, please write them there. Or if you're with teachers or other adults, you can ask them nicely too. And when you do ask questions, please type in where you're writing from. I'm amazed we have over 300 people registered for today. And I would love to know how many countries and cities are here on this webinar. I'm also really delighted to welcome Sumaya Sitayeb today as our British Sign Language Interpreter who is going to make sure this wonderful discussion is as accessible as possible. Okay, enough from me. I'm going to stop talking now and welcome our first wonderful artist to join the room. Farah, hello. Hello, thank you for having me. It's so nice to be here with all of you. Really nice to see you. Thank you so much for being here with us today from Amsterdam. Can you tell us a bit about who you are and what you do? So my name is Farah Fayyad. I'm a graphic designer from Beirut, Lebanon. I'm actually talking to you from Amsterdam right now. I moved here about a year ago and I'm currently a student, much like many of you guys here. I work mainly with printed matter. So I design things like posters, magazines, books, and album covers. You can see some of my work on this slide. Uh, I also work a lot on typography, which is a branch in design that is dedicated specifically to letters. So if you think about it, every font in your computer or on your phone was designed by someone. So they took the time to draw each letter individually and think about how all the letters look once you combine them. Since I come from the Arab world, a big focus in my work is the Arabic script or Arabic letters. I studied calligraphy with a very old school teacher and it was my way of understanding this part of my heritage. The history of Arabic calligraphy is extremely rich. And here on this slide, for example, we see the same sentence written in many different calligraphic styles. And I find it completely amazing that they look so different. All of these can be used as inspiration for the typography that we make today. And on this slide, we see some beautiful historic examples of Arabic calligraphy. I think it's very important to look at our visual culture and visual heritage so that our work has roots. So by understanding our history and our heritage uh, as a reference, it is a way of respecting and learning from the past while being aware, of course, of the changing trends and technologies that we have today. It's amazing to see so many different varieties and styles historically, but also contemporary as well, including the work that you have done over the years. And in terms of the work you've done for Shabak Festival, which uh, I know that, um, well, I've been really excited to see develop. Can you please tell us a bit more about that and what you've been up to? Yeah, of course. So for Shabak, I was able to practice my favorite thing in the world, uh, which is something called lettering. So this is when, instead of writing a word or a sentence with a font on your computer, you take the time to draw it yourself. This means that the letters can look like anything you want them to, and you have the freedom to play as much as you want. So we can think of this as a way of illustrating language. 
so for Shubak gave me four quotes from books by Palestinian authors and asked me to draw them in my own way. So usually I start working by hand always. So I have a huge pencil case filled with all kinds of tools. And when I'm happy with how something looks, I scan it and then work on it on my computer and play with things like colors and details. So the lettering uh, compositions you see on the screen will appear all over London on posters and billboards. So it was very exciting for me to be part of this project. And if I am correct, these billboards and posters are up as of now. So if you are in London, you can see them as you're walking to the shops or walking to school. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And you can also go to Shubak's website and there you can download a map of all the locations. That's amazing. It must be so exciting to see your work in, the, in these sorts yeah. of places. <laughs> And so today we're here to talk about heritage, we're talking about identity, and we're talking about art. And so for yourself as a, as a graphic designer, for the work that you have produced, how does your heritage and how does your identity influence the work that you create? Um, my heritage as a designer from the Arab world is actually the foundation that I'm building my whole career on. And in my work, this has been mainly linked to typography and language. So for me, heritage is both about the things that have passed, like the examples that we saw earlier, but also about the work that is being done today. So together, these form our vis visual culture, which makes the work we do unique. The examples in this slide are from people all over the world that work with the same script. Language and typography for me have been the most basic but important elements of how my heritage influences my work. So for example, I look at very old manuscripts and books, I see how these ancient calligraphers used to compose their letters and their pages. I look at what the rules were, and then I think, how can I break them? But also, of course, while respecting all the work that went into making them. I also look at things like paintings and sculptures and even buildings. Our visual heritage is all around us. And I think the more we know about it, the more we are able to make very special work that comes from someplace real. I love seeing these contemporary examples because obviously it's, a, it's an old script, it's a historic script, but seeing how people are working with it in today and using these amazing colors and styles, it's really, really lovely to see. And I guess linked to that, if I am looking at these images now, these examples, and I'm sure many others who are here with us today are also really enjoying seeing what's in front of them. And we want to try, we want to give it a go. How do we start? How did you get involved with this? And what is the best way that we can start practicing this sort of lettering and calligraphy? Um, so classic calligraphy is actually a huge commitment. And I didn't know this until I started learning it myself. So my teacher comes from a long line of master calligraphers. And he told me that when his father trained him, he had to practice for eight hours a day for 10 years before he got a client, Wow, which is crazy. <laughs> However, uh, lettering can be done by anybody. Uh, the best way to start is to just gather a bunch of tools. So usually I would uh, have paper, pens, with different thicknesses, inks, and then you can also play with random things like forks, fruits, sponges, literally anything you have in the house. So as an exercise, for example, uh, on this slide, I wrote the Arabic letter wo in six different ways. And you can see how one very basic shape can take on so many different forms. So for me, this is what's so fun about working with typography. You guys should definitely try to do this at home. Um, I like to think of letters as people that can have different clothes and different personalities. So you can design your character in any way you want. Uh, so one way of starting is really just playing with different tools and letting your imagination take over. And another way is making an effort to notice all the letters that are around you. So on billboards, shop signs, restaurant menus, really anywhere. I get a lot of inspiration from the world around me. And if you're really super into it, of course, you can find loads of brilliant work on like Pinterest, Behance, Instagram, and you can look at all of these for inspiration. That's great. And yes, we will definitely share a, a, a list of some of the amazing um, inspirations that you have in your work for afterwards. And again, for those of you who have just uh, watched this exercise, but perhaps missed some of the details, we are recording this and we will share it after the call so you can catch up on it and, and do the exercise in your own time and what we'd really really love is that when you do the exercise if you are able to and are interested you can send it in to us and we can try and find some time to show it on the Shabak website i'll share an email with that uh, for for those submissions a bit later farah thank you so much for joining really really appreciate it and i know you're going to come back a little bit later for the yeah. questions and answers
which is actually a great reminder that if you do have any questions, please do pop them in the question and answer section. There's a button at the bottom of your screen, along with your name and where in the world you currently are. We will have some time to go through a few questions at the end. Thank you again, Farah. Next up, we are going to Abu Dhabi. Rand, are you there? Hi, Armin. Hello. Thanks for having me today. Nice to see you. How are you doing? Great. How are you? Yes, very well. Thank you. Very well. So please tell us more about who you are and what do you do? So as you mentioned earlier, I am an Iraqi artist based in Abu Dhabi in the UAE. Uh, a lot of my work explores my heritage through the history of Iraq, where I come from, and that includes its rich ancient Mesopotamian heritage. So some of you may know Iraq is known as the cradle of civilization and over its 5,000 year old history was home to many civilizations, including the Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, and Assyrians. I look at remnants of that history, artifacts, objects, sculptures, as well as architecture and mythology for inspiration to create my own sculptures uh, that attempt to revive and draw attention to that history, especially because much of it has been threatened and destroyed by many decades of neglect and conflict in, in the country. Uh, in addition to that, I'm also interested in collecting oral histories, which are the personal stories, memories, and experiences shared by members of the Iraqi community. This is an element of history that can only survive by being passed down orally or by word of mouth from one generation to the next. I'm sure many of you have had your own experiences with oral history and through the stories uh, your parents or maybe your grandparents have passed down to you about their own memories and experiences. So through drawing, writing, and sculpture, my work documents uh, and creates records of oral histories to allow them to stay alive for future generations to learn about. I love your point about oral histories. I think they're so important. Definitely some of my favorite stories have come from my grandparents and uh, some of the, my favorite things to cook have definitely come from my grandma just telling me and sharing them with me. So I think it's a really, really important point. Um, and I know you have a drawing exercise that you have prepared for us to do, which links in with, with the work that we'll talk a little bit more about later, but can you share a bit more about the drawing exercise um, so that people can look at it and, and do it in their own time perhaps? Of course. So for this exercise, I invite you to each select an object that means a lot to you because of its sentimental or emotional value. It could be something that was gifted to you by someone special or a souvenir from a trip you took, or it could be a family heirloom that was passed down to you. Once you've selected your object, you'll need a pencil and some tracing paper to complete the exercise. So as you see here uh, in some of the videos, uh, you don't have to worry about drawing exact replicas of your objects. The goal is to rediscover them and their qualities through unconventional drawing exercises, so such as tracing around them, um, blind contour, where you focus your eyes on the object and allow your pencil to move freely without looking down at the paper, and drawing by feel, where you close your eyes and focus on moving your fingers over the objects uh, and tracing your movement with your pencil. By layering these drawings, you can start to explore some of their hidden qualities and think about how they can represent your emotional attachment to these objects. That's great. I'm so excited to, to try this at home. And again, if you're, if you're watching from a classroom, you can do this in your own time with your teacher. If you're doing it at home, uh, you can do it in your own time as well. We are recording this and we will share this after so you can have a look at the drawing exercise and, and follow Rand's instructions again. Uh, but yes, Thank you so much for, for sharing that. And of course, again, just to say, when you have done that exercise, uh, please do send your drawings in when you have done them. We will share an email at the end for you to send them. And we're gonna go try and put some on our website. So Brand, tell us about the installation at the Chelsea Physic Garden that you have produced for Shabak Festival. Mm -hmm. So the journey towards my Shabak Festival installation started a year ago with a series of online workshops uh, with a group of women from the Iraqi and Arab diaspora in London. Uh, 
where we explored and discussed our relationship to the places that we come from through the memories and objects we've held on to. Uh, each participant contributed their own personal stories and memories, and together they started to weave a larger picture of the varied experiences of migration. One of the participants, which you see here in this photo, Intisar Hajali, wrote a beautiful text recounting memories of her garden in her home country of Syria, and how the jasmine and grapevine trees that grew there remind her of her cherished memories of home, family, and neighbors. I've been working with Intisar these past few months to transform her text into a performance where she takes visitors on a walk through the Chelsea Physic Garden and recounts her story to them. Not sure if any of you know about or have visited the Chelsea Physic Garden, but it's London's oldest botanical garden and houses a wide variety of plants collected from all around the world. So the plants themselves have their own history of migration. As Intisar takes vi visitors on this walk, they will encounter three sculptures that I've produced. And you can see uh, the photos here. Uh, and they create a dialogue between Intisar's text and the garden and plants you encounter along the way and invite you to reflect on your own experiences and memories. The final sculpture that's also in the garden uh, is a ceramic relief inspired by an ancient Assyrian relief that's currently housed at the British Museum. You see it here. Uh, it, in my reinterpretation, which is made to the same size as the original ancient one, I attempt to capture the journey of the 14 women who participated in the project, each holding their own object and symbolizing their contributions to the collective experience. Such beautiful photos, such a beautiful garden it looks like. I'm really, really excited to get down there myself. And if you have access to West London, uh, and, and you're watching here today, uh, we are offering complimentary tickets for yourself and, and, and your group to attend the garden and see the work of Rand. So please do keep in touch and let us know if you're interested in those tickets. We'd really, really love for everyone to, to come down and see the work themselves. Thank you, Rand. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Right. So it looks like we have some time for questions and answers. I'd love to, to welcome back Farah into the room. Hello. Uh, and also, um, again, just a reminder that we have a, a button at the bottom of the screen um, for you to put your questions in that we will try and answer now. And again, please let us know if you're watching, where you are watching from. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing to see how international this session is today. So, for the first question, we have Fatima, who is uh, asking the question from Bolton Muslim Girls School in the UK. Hello, Fatima and all everyone at the school. Lovely for you to be here. And the question is for Farah. So um, why don't you organize some workshops for younger learners? Obviously, some people are very interested in the work that you've done. So, yeah, have, have you have you organized workshops for younger learners? Would this be something that you're interested in doing? Yes, of course. Actually, a project I'm, I'm working on now at university is called Type Lab. And uh, you can find it on Instagram. It's typelab.sandberg. And I think maybe Arman can, can send it in the chat. So this is exactly what we're doing. We're organizing workshops for people within the university, but also they're open to absolutely anyone from anywhere any age, any background, who has any kind of interest in, um, in typography. Um, so yeah, if you, um, I think we're gonna start again at the beginning of the year. So probably towards end of September or, or early October. So yeah, for sure. Like, of course I love giving workshops. It's one of the best things. That's really good to hear. I might have to uh, sneak myself onto those workshops as well. Yeah. That sounds, <laughs> sounds really, really good. Yeah. And it's great that you'll be able to do them online as well. I think yeah. one of the great things about do, doing these sort of sessions is again, people from all around the world in their own time can join. So that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, we're also actually um, documenting and archiving everything. And the whole aim is for everything that we do with TypeLab to be completely open source uh, and accessible. So yeah, you'll be able to find like the, also a couple of previous workshops that we did. Um, and yeah, any future workshops will also be available long-term. Perfect, perfect. Because uh, yeah, I see Fatima's again asked um, about uh, 
how we would know about the workshop. We'll definitely communicate that to, to everyone when they're interested. Yeah. I'm going to stick with um, uh, Fatima here because she has another question for Rand here, which is about the garden um, and, 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 how, and how they can visit the garden, which, um, how, long's, how long's the actual exhibition on? Uh, the exhibition is on until, uh, I believe, July 19th. I need to double check the uh, date. Um, but you can, as we said, there's a, kind of a possibility for groups to arrange for kind of a complimentary visit to the Chelsea Physic Garden. You can just get in touch with us here. Um, and in addition to that, I guess it's important to mention that the web, the project itself uh, has a website. Uh, it's called the www.actsofrecognition.com. Um, and that serves as almost like a digital archive for the project. And in it, you can uh, learn a little bit about the process, the, the workshops and, and uh, what each participant produced as a result of it. And you can also start to explore the works that are at Chelsea Physical garden. So maybe for some of you who can't make it to the garden or are not in the UK, uh, you can visit the website and there you'll find uh, audio recordings and translated transcripts of Intisar's performance along with images of all the works and, and, and explanations uh, that will help uh, give you a good idea of what it's all about. Thank you. That's amazing. And yeah, just to just to reiterate the point, if you are interested in those free tickets, please do contact us at Shabak and we would love to organize that for you. We have a question now, which is for for both artists. I'll, I'll go to you first, Farah. So uh, we have a question which is around how long it takes to complete a work of art, especially something that is personal to you. So obviously we kind of uh, we, we heard you speak about the, the objects that are um, that are important to you. Uh, so how long does it take to complete something like that or maybe other works that you have produced? Um, so actually for me, it's way harder to work on something personal than to work in collaboration with a, like for a project. Um, and I would say it really depends. I mean, of course, with time, the more you practice, the faster you are at, at doing, like doing your work. Um, but I mean, yeah, usually, I mean, like a lettering composition can take a couple of days, maybe like a week or two, depending on how many times I decide to like revisit, you know, because sometimes you make something and then you sleep on it the next day, you feel like making a bunch of changes and the process can be a bit endless. So sometimes you just have to decide like, okay, this is it, I'm happy with it, we send, you know. And, and how about you, Rand? Um, yeah, I think similar to Farah, I'd say that it, it does vary and it is very hard, uh, much harder to kind of uh, create things that are very personal to you. Um, a lot of my work is research based. Uh, so the research itself takes a lot of time that includes reading, uh, visiting sites, collecting information and slowly kind of processing them and coming up with your response. Now, in terms of the making of things, um, you know, I work in different mediums, so a drawing can take a very different time than a sculpture, but my favorite medium is ceramics. Uh, and it's because you're actually working uh, with the clay with your own hands and kind of allowing them to take over that process. So, you know, you can make a ceramic object in in a matter of an hour or two, but then the process of actually getting it to a finished product takes a bit of time. You wait for it to dry, you fire it, you apply glaze, you fire it again. Um, and that's, I think, part of the joy of kind of seeing something come to life over, a, you know, maybe a month uh, or two of time. I'm gonna stick with both of you again for this, this question, which I love. I think it's a lovely, lovely question. Um, so Rand, for, for you, have you always been artistic? How did you tap into your inner creative energy? Mm, well, I think from a young age, I was always interested in, in creating. Um, so building things or making things or, or drawing things. And um, initially I, I thought that, um, you know, maybe the way to do it would be to pursue architecture. So that is my, my background. Uh, but the making of a building is a very complicated thing that involves years and lots of different people. And so I found that by making things at a smaller scale, like objects or furniture or sculptures, you have a much more intimate uh, relationship with the things that you're producing. Um, and you can actually see them come to life in a much shorter frame of time. 
that's really really interesting and Farah how about yourself um I'm not sure actually it's funny before I like went into graphic design I really I ha was applying for like business and biology and th things like that for my undergrad and then I was uh, going through my old things and looking at notebooks from school and then I realized that in all my margins I was really drawing letters all the time like from when I was really young and I was very lucky I had a cousin who studied graphic design and uh, so we had a, a conversation and then you know she kind of encouraged me to, to apply and then of course I'm super happy that, that this is the path I chose. Um, yeah so sometimes you, you have some kind of creative side that you're not fully aware of but I mean it will definitely manifest one way or another even you know like some people uh, I have a friend for example who studied engineering but is now a filmmaker you know so sometimes you just yeah you think you think you're, you're going in a certain way but yeah your artistic side will come out whether you like it or not I think <laughs> absolutely I think that's the beautiful thing about it I think we all have it perhaps in us and it's just about finding ways to express it and show it so uh, yeah I think both of your points have, have spoken to that beautifully and and linked to that um linked to that journey that you have uh, just described what challenges have you both faced on this journey to having the the successful amazing careers that you now have uh, Rand, do you want to ask that one first? Um, sure. Um, I think, you know, time is always a challenge. Um, you, for me, no, no project ever feels fully complete. Uh, it, it almost always feels like it's part of the journey to the next one. Um, and so I, I find myself kind of continuing to return back to ideas or, or you know, works from, from years ago and kind of trying to build on them continuously. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, that's something that is good to embrace that never seeing things as a kind of final finished work, but always just part of a longer journey um, and, and feeling free to return to ideas and continuing to explore them um, and, and developing them and allowing yourself to grow through them. That's beautiful, and I completely agree. And I think it's a linked, it's a linked question. And and Farah, maybe you'd like to come in on this one. But in terms of some of the school students who are perhaps listening in here and and hearing yourself and Rand speak about the work that you do, and are considering maybe taking an artistic subject, but are maybe scared to move away from more traditional subjects, what sort of advice would you give? What sort of advice did you did you uh, receive when you were thinking about? moving into the work that you do from, from biology and, and maths? Um, I mean, the fear, of course, is, is justified. It's always scary to go into something unknown, especially if you, you know, come from a background where this is not like really very much like encouraged by the community, let's say. Um, I think if, if there's something you're convinced of, then you just can 100% go for it. Also, it's never too late to change ever. Um, and in uh, graphic design in general, it's such a massive field and it's continuously growing. So I don't think like it, there should be a fear of kind of like finding your place in the world because actually graphic design is like almost in literally everything around us. So every website, every book, every magazine, every billboard, animation, films, you know, video games, it's, you, you can literally go into anything. So, um, so no, if anyone is interested, I would 100% encourage getting into the field and then slowly figuring out what kind of like small branch or niche or um, like specialization you would like to pursue. Give it a go and have fun. I think those are all really, exactly. really important lessons. So we are unfortunately at the end of the 30 minutes, which is crazy to say that it's gone so quickly. I know there are a few more questions uh, in, in the chat, but um, as we're out of time, we will get those answered via email and, and come back to you. Um, perhaps with Rand and Farah, we can go over them later and, and respond, uh, as well as with any kind of further follow-up information about sending drawing exercises and, 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 and everything else. Um, thank you so much, Farah, Rand. It's been really, really nice to speak to you today. Thank you for the uh, for the exercises. I'm really, really excited to see attendees, what they produce. Again, we'll share the email for, for you to send those exercises to.
And again, just to further, again, reiterate, if you are around and want to see Iran's work at the Chelsea Physic Garden, we are offering complimentary tickets. Please get in touch with us via the email that we'll share with you. Thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you to Qatar Foundation International. This has been Shabak Festival, Unearthing Heritage. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.